Hello and welcome to Morton's on the Move. How much solar do you need for your RV? Well, if money isn't an issue, you could pretty much put as much solar as you want on there and do all sorts of things. But the real question is, what is the minimum amount of solar that you need on your RV to really make an impact or power everything that you want? Today, we are going to be taking a look at the different considerations for the amount of solar on your RV and figure out how much is the right amount for your RV. Welcome back, I'm Tom and my wife and I have been full-time RV traveling since 2015. We publish thousands of articles about RVing and travel over on our website, mortensonthemove.com. And today we're gonna to be covering one of the topics that we dive into in detail over there, which is how much solar power do you need for your RV? Now, I'm an electrical engineer and I've worked in the solar industry both in residential and commercial applications, but having been on the road for so long, we have done an awful lot with RV solar and we've developed some techniques to help people figure out how much power they actually need on their RV, primarily so that they can get the benefits from it, but also not waste their money. We personally went crazy putting 2,760 watts of solar on our 33 foot fifth wheel, but do you really need this much power? We've got an article breaking down all of this information that I'm gonna put a link to in the description below and in the top comment that you're welcome to dive into if you wanna follow along. So let's first take a quick look at how much power solar panels can actually make. Well, if money is no limitation, then you can really do whatever you want with solar. It just takes more space for more panels. Solar power can ultimately power your entire house. It could power your entire town. It could really power everything that we need. It just takes a lot more space. Now, our system puts out around 2000 watts of power in peak sun, which is like running a small generator all the time. We had about a 2000 watt generator. And it can also run some of our larger appliances, but not all the time. It can run our air conditioner for a few hours, but not overnight. However, during the day, we produce about 16,000 watt hours of energy and we don't always use all that, but we do have an electric car that the system automatically dumps the excess power into. And herein lies the crutch with solar. If you don't have a means to use that extra power, you're gonna end up wasting it. And that is not something you wanna be paying for and then not using. In a residential application, a lot of times you can sell that extra power back to the grid, but in an off-grid application, like an RV, that power's just not going anywhere. It's not even being produced if your batteries are full and you're not using it. So we're gonna take a look at how to figure out how much you should really put on your RV and not waste that money. Okay, to kick things off with a solar power system design, we first need to think about the limitations of the RV. Now, there are three primary limitations that we really need to consider before we even start to think about how much solar we can put on the RV. Limitation number one is cost. Now, for most people, how much money you can actually spend on it is going to be a large limitation. You have to think about not only the cost of the solar panels, but also the batteries and all the electronics that make up the power system. If you've only got $2,000 to spend on a system, then we're not gonna be putting 15,000 watts of solar on your RV or off-grid project. So definitely know what your budget is and we're gonna work to stay within that throughout the project. And if your cost is the limiting factor, we might just build the system up to that cost and not even worry about doing the calculations to figure out how much power you need. Because any solar that you add is going to make the off-grid life better. It's gonna limit your generator runtime and improve your quality of life. Now, the second major limitation to any RV solar system is weight, because any weight that we add to the RV is taking away from the gross vehicle weight rating or how much other stuff we can carry. It's very important not to overload your vehicle. Our first RV, we overloaded and we ended up having to change the RV completely. So don't make the mistake that we did and don't build a solar system that is so heavy that you can't carry anything else in the RV. 
The last major limitation is the space. RVs being smaller and primarily the amount of roof space where solar panels are usually installed is going to be a huge limiting factor. You're not going to be installing 4,000 watts of solar on a 20 foot travel trailer. It's just not feasible. So if we figure out how much space you have and your budget is high enough, you could just max out that space. But you also have to consider the weight. If we max out the space, it's going to be heavier. All of these things need to be taken into account when designing a system. And we're not going to be going into that too much. We're just going to be looking at how much solar we actually think we're going to need. But you're definitely going to have to consider these three limitations when designing the system. Now, once you've figured out your limitations, the next thing you're going to want to think about is the uh, load slash uh, generation balancing act. So how much power you're using to how much power you're producing. Now, a lot of times a solar system is built, an off-grid solar system is built to make up about 50 to 90% of the energy needs over the course of using the RV or the off-grid property. The last 10% or 50%, depending on how big you build the system, still needs to be offset with an additional, usually fuel source, so a generator. A lot of times we can design the system to meet all of the energy needs on a sunny day, but if you get cloudy days, a whole bunch of them in a row, we're not trying to build the system to continue to power the RV if it is cloudy and you're still going to have to have that backup energy source. So that is what we're going to be doing next. We're going to be trying to figure out how much energy we're going to consume and balance it to how much solar we're going to install on the RV. Okay, we're about to get into some of the technical here, and you can follow along with the article, but I really want to encourage you to head over to our website where we have a free RV solar calculator. I spent some time putting together some really basic things that you can just check off and say what type of RV you're using, and it will spit out a general solar size recommendation. At the end, you can also put in your email and get a free email course specific to that solar power size and a whole bunch of information about different options around it. This is going to be a lot simpler and definitely step one if you're thinking about going solar. I highly recommend that you give our solar calculator a try. It's completely free and there's a whole bunch of good information. I'm going to reference a few other articles and pieces of information, but that email course is going to provide a wealth of knowledge as you kick off into your RV solar journey. If you feel overwhelmed at all, definitely go and check out that calculator, but let's get into the next step of what you need to do to figure out how much energy you're actually consuming in your RV so that we can match it to the solar you're going to be installing. To figure out how much energy we're actually using, what we're going to do is a system audit. So we're gonna figure out how much energy we're currently using in the RV off grid. And we're gonna do that by one of two different methods. The first method is actually using meters that we're gonna install on the RV and figure out how much power it's consuming. And the second method is by hand. Now, you're gonna to have to do the second method if you don't have an RV yet and you're trying to figure out how much solar you're gonna need. But if you already have the RV, which is the preferred method, I highly recommend that you install these meters we're gonna talk about and figure out how much energy you're actually using because it's gonna give you a much, much better number to work with. So method number one, adding monitoring. Now, there's two different ways to add monitoring. We can add battery monitoring, which is actually gonna be the first component to any solar system. It's a battery monitor. If you're not gonna be installing an inverter, which actually converts the DC power to AC power so you can run your appliances in the RV, then you can probably get away with just monitoring your DC power or your battery. If you're gonna be adding an inverter, then I highly recommend that we actually monitor the amount of AC power that we use in the coach. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but let's first talk about monitoring the DC power. Now, if you are gonna be installing an inverter, you can still do this because it can shed a lot of light on your system. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually install a battery monitor. Now, I highly recommend the Victron BMV 712. This is a highly accurate battery monitor. You're gonna to need to put a shunt in the next negative line between the batteries and all of the loads in the coach. And then it's going to have a little computer screen that's going to figure out all of 
uh, how much energy is being consumed. Now, the setup of that is a whole nother video altogether. There's lots of forums and information about how to do that. It's gonna vary depending on your batteries. But if you install one of these, then what you're gonna need to do is go out and use the RV as if you're off grid. So what this means is if you are hooked up to shore power, disconnect the battery charger in the breaker. So you're gonna have the battery monitor set up, make sure the batteries are fully charged, shut off the breaker and use the RV. Keep an eye on the battery monitor, just use the RV as if you were off grid. And as it draws down, when the batteries get to about 50%, uh, if they're lead acid, you can go all the way down to say 20% if they're lithium ion, then you're going to want to recharge them. But when they get to that 50%, you're going to want to note how many amp hours you consumed and how long it took to get there. Ideally, you want to go 24 hours so you can know how much energy you've consumed in a 24 hour period. That is the goal with any energy audit is to figure out how much energy you've consumed in the RV over a 24 hour period. So if you can go 24 hours, great. You're gonna get an amp hour reading over the 24 hours. If you can only go 12 hours, then what you're gonna to wanna to do is recharge the batteries, but take the amp hour reading at the 12 hours and multiply it by two. Now, again, you can head to our website. The article has examples of these calculations that should make a lot more sense. But basically, what you're going to be trying to do is calculate how many amp hours you're going to use over a 24 hour period and then multiply it by the nominal voltage of the batteries so that we can get a watt hour number. Watt hours is what we're going to need to calculate to figure out how much energy we need to produce. Watt hours is actual energy. Amp hours is more actually a state of charge. So everything we're going to do is in watt hours. So that's how we're going to do an energy audit for the DC side. But if you're going to be installing an inverter, we can do an even easier way to figure out how much energy the coach uses. And that's by using a meter between the coach and the shore. Now, the meter that I prefer to use is uh, the Hughes Power Watchdog. This is designed for RVs, and it also has the capability to disconnect the RV if anything weird happens with the power. I highly recommend having one of these units. It's more than just a surge protector. It can protect you from a low voltage, high voltage, or different issues with the system but it can also act as a power meter. If you wanna get a power watchdog, Hughes offers a discount for all of our viewers. I'm gonna put information about that in the description below. Now, to monitor the system with one of these meters, what you're gonna do is make sure that your batteries are fully charged, plug in your RV through the meter, go into the Bluetooth app and reset that meter to zero. Now use the coach for a 24 hour period and you can leave the battery charger on because that's gonna be providing power to the DC side as well. So all of the power that's consumed by the coach will be measured in this system. Now what you do need to do is consider that you are gonna be operating in off grid mode, right? So we're not gonna be running the air conditioner and different things like that. If you do anything like that, then it's really gonna throw off your numbers. You're gonna to try to be conservative and only run the appliances that you would if you're off grid. If you are putting in an inverter and you're planning to run your coffee maker or your hair dryer or a CPAP machine overnight, that's perfectly okay. Go ahead and use those devices. But if you're going to be, uh, using your air conditioner, that will probably need the generator. So don't use the really high load appliances and try to keep that power consumption down. Now the power watchdog is going to go ahead and give you that number in kilowatt hours, how much power you actually consumed. It's the same number we tried to calculate through the battery meter, but it's going to just give it to you uh, straight out. It's gonna, you're gonna have to remember to go back. There's no way to actually set it for a 24 hour period. You're gonna have to remember to go back and say, it's been 24 hours, that's how much power I used. Now you could do it for a couple days if you want and kind of average those numbers out to get an even better number, but it's gonna give you a pretty good idea of how much power overall your RV actually uses when hooked up to shore power. And it's gonna give us that number so that we can work on figuring out how to offset it with solar. Now, like we talked about earlier, the second method to this whole thing is calculating it all by hand. Now you can do this by actually going to every single device, looking at how many watts it consumes, and then figuring out how many hours you're gonna use it. Now you're gonna be able to 
go ahead and multiply the watts the uh, product is using by the hours that you're going to be using it and get a watt hour number. Add up all the devices in the coach and you should have a rough estimate of how much energy you're going to consume in a day's period. Now, this is actually a helpful thing to do if, say, you were doing the battery audit and you didn't run your fantastic vent or your furnace overnight. You can go through and say a fantastic vent's going to use 720 watt hours, an estimate, uh, over a period if it's hot out or the furnace is going to burn 1200 watt hours running at a 50 percent duty cycle overnight. Again, actually doing those calculations can be a little bit tedious and figuring out those numbers can be challenging. But if you feel like doing it, you're gonna to have to put a big old spreadsheet together and you can calculate an estimate of how much power you need. Again, you can do some of those calculations and add them to your real world usage if you feel like you need to add additional components that you didn't necessarily use during your energy audit. Again, all this information is in a little bit more detail in the article. I highly recommend going through it if you're trying to actually do these calculations. Okay, so we've got how much energy the coach is using. Now we need to figure out how much solar to add to the roof to offset that energy, or at least get an understanding of how much energy the solar we put on the roof will make so we can have an idea of how much we can offset. If we're trying to offset 50 or 90% or all of it during a sunny day. So how do we go about figuring out how much energy solar panels can produce? Well, this can be a bit of a tricky calculation because there's a lot of variables that go into play, where your location is, how much cloud cover you get. All these different things really affect how much energy a solar panel is going to produce. However, we do have a general kind of a North America nationwide estimate that we can use, which is that a 100 watt solar panel will typically generate on average around 350 watt hours of power per day. So using that, we can really easily divide the number of watt hours that we figured out how much our coach is using. So let's say we uh, determined our coach needs 1500 watt hours of energy in a day. You can divide that by 350 watt hours and get a really rough estimate of how many 100 watt solar panels you would need. So 1500 watt hours divided by 350 watt hours equals 4.28 or 4.28 times 100 watt solar panels or 428 watts of solar to equal the needs for a 24 hour period. Now this is an extremely rough calculation and as an engineer, this is not an acceptable way to figure out a real world uh, energy output of a solar panel because uh, it varies massively over the course of the year and location. But there is a really simple tool that we can use to get a much, much more accurate uh, calculation of how much solar a panel is going to put out. And this tool is called PV Watts. I'm going to put a link in the description below to PV Watts, but it is a tool that was put together by NREL or the National Renewable Energy Laboratories that allows you to put in a solar system, a solar size in any location, and it will estimate how much power it will produce each month over the course of a year. It's not designed for RVs, but it can be used. But what we're gonna have to do to use it for RVs is estimate where you're gonna use the RV and when. So to do this, what I recommend is heading over to Google Maps, drop a pin in any location that you plan to use the RV, and grab an address. You're gonna need an address to use in PV Watts because it's designed for a residential application. So drop a pin and grab any nearby address. It can be a business address, a house address, it doesn't matter, but pick a general geographic location. It doesn't have to be where you're gonna be camping exactly. It just needs to be in the region that you're gonna be in. Go ahead and take that address, head over to PV Watts and drop it into the address bar. PV Watts is going to ask to confirm the location, and then in the next step, it's going to start to ask for system information. 
Now, I highly recommend using that basic calculation of 350 watt hours per 100 watt panel to kind of give you a base estimate to start with. And you're gonna take that number of solar panels and plop it into the system information section of PV watts. Now, PV watts is gonna ask for system size in kilowatts. So kilo equals thousands. So the 450 watt system is gonna be point Four, five. So 450 divided by 1000.45 kilowatts. Put that in how large the system is. Then it's going to ask for a whole bunch of other stuff. There's going to be different uh, panel types. There's going to be standard, high efficiency, or the uh, thin film. Thin film is very uncommon. If you're using high efficiency perk solar panels or something like it, you can put high efficiency or you could just leave it standard. That's a pretty good uh, estimate. And then there's going to be an array type. Uh, leave it at fixed uh, roof amount because otherwise it's going to be tracking the sun and we're not going to be doing that on an RV. And then it's going to have system losses and system losses. Uh, it's going to give you uh, at something around 14% is kind of the, the standard. I highly recommend leaving that in if you're going to be using an inverter. However, if you aren't going to be using an inverter, you can drop that down to about 8%. System losses are losses in the wires, losses in the conversions. 14% uh, is a pretty good estimate. I've found that to be pretty accurate overall. There's gonna be a tilt option. That should be zero if you're gonna leave the panels completely flat on the RV. At a later date, you can see what tilting them will do, tilting them towards the south, but let's start out by leaving that at zero. And then the azimuth isn't gonna matter. That's gonna be how, what angle they're pointed at. If it's zero, that's gonna be, um, it doesn't matter what angle that is, but if you are gonna point the panels, if they're gonna be pointed directly south, that azimuth would be 180 degrees. In PV watts, they're also gonna ask about the um, type and the electric rate. Don't mess with these, it doesn't matter. That's for selling energy back to the grid. In an RV, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but it is kind of fun. You'll be able to actually figure out how much energy uh, you'll be saving with your solar panels. Uh, I just, you don't really need to mess with that at all. Go ahead and put that information in and hit the next button. So now the calculator is going to take that information. It's gonna compare it to information based on uh, the solar availability, where it is located, how much cloud cover and weather the area gets, and it's gonna estimate a yearly output, but it's also gonna break those outputs down by month for you. So what you're gonna do is take this monthly number and figure out where and when you're going to be camping so if you're gonna be camping July, August, September, grab those numbers. I usually take the lowest of those numbers and then you can divide that number by 30. So in the case of the, uh, the example we've put together, the 450 watts, it says we're gonna produce 472 kilowatt hours per year. And then we're gonna be looking at the summer months and the lowest of the summer months that will be there is 57 kilowatt hours that our 450 watt system will produce in the location that I chose. Divide that by 30. And it says that we're gonna produce 1.9 kilowatt hours per day on average in August. We compare that to the 1500 watt hours that we originally wanted to offset and this should work. So in general, the 450 watt panels are going to be more than adequate to meet our 1500 watt hour per day need. Now keep in mind that this is gonna be full sun. So some days you're still not gonna meet your needs, uh, but meeting that 24 hour period is just kind of a, a good estimate. However, if you plan on using heavy loads and appliances, plan to run your generator during those times. Now I've used PV Watts many, many times to do these calculations. I've even run it against my actual production while we've traveled in different locations and found that its output tends to be very accurate. So I highly recommend using PV Watts to give you a really good number of how much energy you'll actually be able to produce and you can compare to how much energy you actually use in your RV. So that's basically it. You can take a look at all your limitations. You can take a look at how much energy you use and you can take a look at how much energy you will produce. Put them all together to figure out what the correct answer for your needs will be. 
The last piece of the equation, which could be an entire other video in itself, and we have a lot of information about it. Again, I'm gonna recommend going to that solar calculator because it's going to help you walk through this last step. But this last step is going to be figuring out how much battery power you need. My best recommendation for this is to calculate out how much energy capacity you can store in a 24 hour period and match that to the energy needs of the coach for a 24 hour period. This is going to give you usually about two days runtime with making a little bit of solar and then you'll be able to recharge them with a generator if you have extended days with less sun. Calculating how much energy a battery can store is very simple. What you're gonna need to do is take the amp hour capacity of a battery and then multiply that by the nominal voltage, just like we did before with the battery meter. So if you have a 100 amp hour lithium iron, ba iron phosphate battery that has a nominal voltage of 13 volts, multiply 13 by 100 amp hours to get the 1300 watt hours that that battery can store. Keep in mind that if you're gonna be using lead acid batteries, you should really only discharge those batteries 50% before you recharge them. So a 100 amp hour uh, lead acid battery, say you uh, make that a 50 amp hour capacity battery, multiply that by 12.6 volts because they have a lower nominal voltage. As you can see, immediately the lead acid batteries have a lot less capacity in them. They weigh a lot more. And truthfully, I never recommend lead acid batteries in a solar power setup because they are just not ideal for it. A lead acid battery is fantastic for a starting battery in a car because it provides an enormous amount of power and can get recharged right away. But in a solar power system where the sun is never constant and the charge is fluxing up and down, it's charging, discharging, charging, discharging. That is the worst case scenario for a lead acid battery. It causes sulfation. It causes all kinds of problems. You should never discharge it below 50% and it will damage the battery over time. A lithium iron phosphate battery is the best choice for a uh, RV. What you're gonna find is that they are so much better with solar and they just work better. We actually replaced lead acid batteries in this coach with the lithium iron phosphate. And we found that we made 30% more off our existing solar power system just because the more efficiencies of the batteries and the higher voltages. Also, these batteries are gonna last 10 years where we have had batteries die in two years or less trying to run them on solar uh, with lead acid. So. Just gonna throw that out there. I would definitely add the cost of lithium batteries in your solar system. You can also get away with less battery just because if you drain it all the way down, you're not gonna hurt it like you would with a lead acid battery. The very last thing I wanna to touch on is that you don't need to overbuild your system up front. But what I do recommend is pulling extra wires and be prepared for additional expansion in the future. Once you get a taste for solar, a lot of times you're gonna wanna expand it later and pulling the wires to the roof can be a real pain. So pull additional wires or oversize the wires to the roof. Also keep in mind, you might need additional space for extra batteries in the future. You don't need to build your biggest system up front, but being able to expand it in the future is a great idea. So that's a way to save money, test out solar, and just figure out how everything works. All right, I really hope that this video has helped you out and helped you kick off your solar journey. Like I said, that solar calculator is a great way if you're new to solar to start off and really learn things, but using these techniques, definitely using PV watts to figure out your uh, capacity and doing the energy audit are all great ways to get a really good idea how much solar you actually need. As always, thanks so much for watching. We're so glad that you're here. Please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, stay safe, and we are gonna see you down the road.